Hmm. Okay, I guess we have a quorum. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start the uh, next session. And we are very honored to uh, have uh, the next two talks, the, the PIs on uh, the other instruments on, uh, on Aura, the ones interested in, especially on uh, the troposphere. And first of all, uh, I would like to welcome Reinhard Beer, the PI on TESS. Um, but if your Latin's up to it, <laughs> um, I was the PI. <laughs> so, in fact, I'm going to talk very, very little about TESS and a great deal more about, about the history of the project from the point of view of, of a PI. So, and it's going to be a somewhat different spin than what you got from, what you got from Mike King. <laughs> Okay, uh, Mike uh, uh, said it was System Z, and I think he's he's probably right, but I've still no idea where the Z came came from. So the AO came out. And the proposals were due at headquarters on July the fifteenth, nineteen eighty-eight, which as it would happen was sixteen years to the day <laughs> before we launched. So I'm, I'm, I'm about to numb you with statistics, but, but bear in mind, you, 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 you only have to bear, bear with it for, for 16 minutes. We had to bear with it for 16 years. <laughs> so, okay. The official acceptance um, letters came out on February the 2nd, 1989. And we had the first IWG at, at JPL. And then in April, there was a National Academy, Academy Review right here. And this is quite normal for, for big, big pro programs. I remember a number of 30, of 30 billion, and Mike said it was 50 billion, was it? Yeah. So now, as we get to the infamous payload panel, <laughs> Barry and Maud decided we had all gone through truly rigorous instrument reviews for, for months and months. Barry and Maud decided he was going to ignore everything that had gone on before and conduct his own instrument reviews um, using the IDS teams as the reviewers. The instrument science team, of course, objected to having reviews from people who've never measured anything in their lives. And so, <laughs> but, but we were told, sit down and shut up. This is the way it's going to be. Um, I personally found, found it to be, um, to be quite offensive and insulting, and I still do. <laughs> <laughs> so the payload panel had its first meeting uh, at the University of New Hampshire, which was Berry and Moore's home institution at the time. D we, were, we were allowed to attend, but told to go and sit at the back of the room and keep our mouths shut. So, we didn't, of course. But <laughs> But then the following day, there was the first meeting of the Atmospheres panel at Goddard, and this was, and this is a completely intentional pun, it was a totally different atmosphere from, from, from the previous day, and it really was quite collegial. Unfortunately, and the Atmospheres panel was, was never particularly effective, in my view, of promoting atmospheric science. Okay, so since we objected to the payload panel, Berry and Moore decided to have his revenge and decided to have the payload panel again in New Hampshire in, in the depths of winter. So just getting there was a, 
was a, was a fun that was not fun but at least by now we were allowed to speak up for our so the IDS teams was were a, um, were a problem and the problem is that there was cross membership between the instrument teams and the, and the IDS teams so there were blatant conflicts of interest so you, could, you got the deselected descope their experiment uh, not ours and ours is a lot more important anyway so it, and now unfortunately there's a long gap in my records and um, um, you're probably glad of that actually <laughs> but it was during that time that the original 30 um, plus instruments eventually were whittled down to 13 and two of which modis and series flew twice and since I know some of the deep <coughs> selectees I can tell you that some of them are still very unhappy about this after all of these years but it's uh, um, it's interesting to know that none of the IDS teams um, um, survived beyond the mid 90s. <laughs> okay, so then the IWG and the payload m panel. What I'm trying to tell you here is, is so we would have two, four, six, six meetings a year to which we were expected to. Um, to attend, and at that time, the, um, I don't know, the third th third spacecraft was called Cam, but and that and that happened on on July the 29th, and since that, then accounted for all of the. Um, for all of the instruments, the payload panel went out of ex went out of existence, and weren't we all pleased? <laughs> so, 1998, um, Tess had its pre preliminary design review, and the only reason why I bring that up is is that all of the other instruments would have had their PDLs at about the, the same time um, but once you get through PDR and retire all of the, retire all of the action <coughs> all of the action items and some instruments not, t not TESS of course but, but some of the instruments have got well over 100 RFAs and I think we got away with about 30 or 40 And uh, the following year, about 18 months later, we went through the critical design review. And once you've gone through uh, a critical design review, the design, it, 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 the design is essentially f frozen. It's almost impossible to change anything beyond that point. And December the 18th, as you know, um, Terra was launched. <coughs> But this was the time, I'm just, I, I'm, you, can't, I'm, you can't read this, but this was the time when it was decided that Chem was not an appropriate name for a spacecraft and it was time for a change. And so there um, two alternatives were um, um, proposed and one, was, and one was Aura and one was Dobson. And I think it was Gata Mazara who decided that Aura was the was the name it was going to be. Do you remember that, John? Was the, was the <laughs> so then, sometime during that spring, that name change name change um, happened. And, one of the, and we started having aura science team meetings and thanks to Peter Nell 
So we had a truly splendid, splendid one near Utrecht. I'm right at tulip time. <laughs> and that was really nice. And then Aqua launched on May the 4th in 2002. Oh, and here is the, um, um, the real aura spacecraft, um, MLS, the, the top hurdles below, and um, chest be, be below that, and, and, and only at the end. So. And here is the, the test instrument. Uh, and that's the earth shade that's sticking out that you can see there. So, so, we had a pre-ship review in 2003, and I believe only had already been delivered the, the previous fall. But, but then we had well over a year's worth of, worth of instrument integration, um, and then in May 2004, uh, we had a launch rehearsal. My records are a bit confused here. Oh, we all went to Vandenberg because there was a group photograph, which I'm going to show you in a second. But I'm not sure that that was the occasion that the group photograph was taken. But then finally, on July the 15th, 2004, are we, are we we got launched out, um, out of Vandenberg at three o'clock in the morning, and just like um, Dave Ed, I'd gone home the day before, <laughs> 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 and, and, so, and so I got to watch it on a large screen TV. I'm not, I'm not in a pub; it was actually at JPL. <laughs> so. Uh, and there's 16 years in, in 16 minutes. <laughs> and now I'm going to give you some passing thoughts of my own. Oh, here is... The well, gentleman in the middle is Phil, Phil DeCola, um, who was the headquarters program scientist. And that's Mark Shaw rule there. And the, the Hirsu gentleman at the end is Joe Waters, <coughs> who has basically dropped off the planet. <laughs> and, uh, whenever I ask where, where um, um, Joe is, he's, he's gone off hiking in the mountains some, somewhere. Okay, so uh, um, here's my, my recipe for instant... For instant um, instrument of success. Of course, this has to be a bit tongue in cheek um, because if I really knew the answer, there would never be another competition again, right? <laughs> okay, got three minutes. So obviously, you need, um, you need a good idea, but, but, uh, but then you, you, you've got to be able to uh, persuade your colleagues and managers that um, you're not uh, totally uh, nuts. And then you better go out and find some co-investigators co and the more international co eyes you find, the better. And NASA and NOAA love in international cooperation, they think it's, it, saves, it saves money, and that, that's wrong because there is no such thing as a free instrument. <laughs> so then you, then you write a proposal and get it reviewed by anybody who's willing um, to, um, to read it, and most institutions, JPL for example, that example mandate this step, but do pay attention to the comments because the reviewers always spot flaws and, and occasional outright, outright errors, and, and then rewrite the 
proposal and you may do that more than once. <laughs> so get an engineering team then. At, at JPL I, could, I could, could quite literally walk next door but, um, but at most places you need to go out. So I just bear in mind that once the engineers take over, they take over, they control the budget, you don't. <laughs> So submit the proposal. It could be months before you learn your fate, so, so don't give up your daytime job. <laughs> so if you succeed, throw a party. If not, try and find out what the problem was from debriefings or, or whatever. And, um, and bear in mind, the, the, the rejection rate for, for proposals of this class is 9 out of 10. So, so that means uh, you have a 10% um, chance of success. You'll then be asked, if you're successful, you'll be asked to write a science requirements document. Please note the word requirements. Forget about goals. Engineers don't work to goals, they work to requirements. And, and they can't always meet, meet your requirements, so they come back to you and say, change your requirements. <laughs> the test science requirement document went through six complete editions. <laughs> <laughs> so go to as many engineering team meetings as you can or to which they invite you or even go to the ones that they don't invite you <laughs> because you'll find no matter how carefully you've written your requirements document someone will misinterpret it <laughs> and uh, the everyone knows that t t truly is a d death wish. Um, everyone doesn't know that. <laughs> so be completely explicit. And last, d um, um, d many of us came out of uh, of an of an environment where we physically built our own instruments in the lab or for, or for the aircraft. Bear in mind, once you're building a spacecraft in, in instrument, the only time that you, you, you will get anywhere near it is that once or twice they'll put you in a gown and mask and stick you in front, and stick you in front of the instrument, suitably distant <laughs> from it. Um, and there are actually good, uh, good reasons for that. Um, um, but that's enough of that. I have two more quick slides. Um, everyone has mentors. I had several, and one who could could well have been called could have could have been called a taskmaster. <laughs> but but um, there is one I, I wish I. How do you probably never heard of this gentleman? Although, if you live in in California, uh, there is uh, there is a county named after him, and a state university named after him, and and, and Germany has a Humboldt University. So, but, but 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 this is one of my favourite quotes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> done. <laughs> In your list of uh, IWGs, I didn't. I thought there was one in Easton that was during the winter. I remember perfectly the snow. Um, um, I did. Um, I did have one there in Easton, I believe. I, I thought, thought that you had a date of October or something. Oh, am I, am I allowed to backtrack? <laughs> yes. I remember that one too. Yeah. Um, 
Like yeah, October the sixth. The aura meetings. Yeah. There was an aura meeting last year. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm afraid my memory doesn't go back <laughs> quite that far. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, our next talk is by another PI. This, this time, uh, Peter Nell Velt, the PI of Omi. Okay, let's see if I can find it. Okay, um, I'm very honored to have been invited to this uh, day for you, Jan. So uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, the request was to talk about uh, tropospheric research and, uh, and also to say some personal things about you. Uh, so I try to make a mixture. So it will be a mixture of some uh, reflection of myself and also results maybe on OMI, but I have a result of a combined OMI hurdles, uh, which we actually um, were able to do this year. And it was done by Maria, who also worked for you. Yeah. So I will uh, come to that in the end. Um, many of you probably think that I know John from the Aura mission. So when I became PI of the OMI instrument, However, I already knew him before that, uh, when I was visiting scientist here at NCAR in 1997, more like a postdoc, and I was asked to come here by, by Guy, and in the end I worked for Guy and for you, together with Boris Katatov, on the assimilation of MLS data, ozone data, in the uh, Rose model. So uh, what you see uh, here on the right hand side is myself at that time, early 30s, biking up the hill every day. <laughs> uh, I was here between February and July, July, and I think I missed only three days not biking up this hill because it was a stack of snow, it was impossible to bike up. Uh, so I had an extremely good time, uh, good time here. I was actually, uh, I think, end of 80s. I was for the first time in Boulder when I was still doing my PhD on uh, spectroscopy in the, in the lab. And the first time I came here, I thought, I want to come back here. And uh, Guy uh, made that happen, and I'm still very, very grateful that uh, that happened. And since then, I'm regularly here, maybe every year, every two years, sometimes only for a week, but uh, I extremely enjoy to, to come to Boulder always. So um, in July 1997, I went back to uh, KNMI. Uh, it was the end of this kind of postdoc period, uh, but three weeks late later, I was back in August. And I came to an aura meeting, or camp meeting still at that time, uh, to present uh, OMI. We were not part yet of the mission because uh, the Japanese, they withdrew their instruments. So it was a possibility to put OMI on the, on the, uh, on the mission. So and many people here thought that I didn't leave at all. I was just continue staying here and giving this talk at this uh, aura meeting. And then I went, went back again and I actually didn't really think about it because we tried to get the OMI instrument on the METOPS uh, series. 
and uh, that in the end didn't succeed it became comb two so I was really, I, I thought, well, it's nice. I, was, I wanted to go here because I liked it here so much, but it was not like, okay, this will be the instrument uh, to be flown on Aura. Uh, and then on April 1st, 1998, uh, at KNMI, I still remember it very clearly, I was at, uh, sitting at a desk together with Henny Kelder and Piet Stammers, and we got the message that our government decided, has, had decided to deliver OMI to uh, the Aura mission, or the CAM mission at that time. And I didn't believe it because it was April 1st. <laughs> <laughs> but it turned to be out the case. So, uh, and then I think about a year, half a year later, a couple of months later, I was decided I would be the PI of the instrument. And uh, well, I had suddenly a completely different role. And that's what you also see in this uh, photo which many people already already showed. Um, you see me, he, it's me, uh, standing with all these uh, great PIs. And when I was here at NCAR in this, during this postdoc period, I, re I remember John, I visited him sometimes in his office, and it's still the same. You have stacks of papers everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and there's someone in between, he puts out the right one. He was always having telecons and whatever. And during the time, I also discovered that you did not have one office, but you had three offices. One here, one at university, and one at the Mesa lab, of course. And all with all these stacks of papers. <laughs> so I was thinking, oh my God, so this PI ship must be like, oh, this. I was looking like that to the PIs, you know. And suddenly, one year later, I was one of them. <laughs> and that was really strange uh, experience for me, because when you look at this, uh, uh, what I could have said, well, I, I turned out to be the only female, but I was not, and I was extremely happy with that. Anne was there. In Holland, I would have been the only one. But luckily here, you were more advantaged. And we already have a leading scientist, female scientist, which was very important for me, actually, to feel better part of this group, because the age difference was also there. And uh, I looked at all these PIs being, has these long careers, and now doing these important, responsible jobs, and I didn't have that experience, because I was so much younger. Uh, Mark Schroeber always said when we were discussing the fuel, which we still have on, uh, on our own hall, how long the satellite could last. He said, well, by that time, all the PIs will be old in retirement homes, but the only team will still be alive and kicking. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, <coughs> my introduction to this, uh, this team. So this satellite you already saw. Is, this is all me. This is the optical in the box. This is the electronic box. So this is actually, and, uh, and that I have to cut you around here. Like this is also the electronic box, but it's built by, uh, uh, by NASA basically to translate our European electronic signals to something this American satellite could understand because the instrument was designed for a European satellite, METOP. So it never comes without cost. That's, that's true. So, um, well, and you see that our uh, contribution is, is a modest contribution, small instrument to all this big. American uh, adv adventures. And also, I, I did also miss the actual launch one day before I went home, and I viewed it at KMI, where we had a direct link to, uh, to the launch event. So, um, I will now talk a little bit more about uh, <coughs> the scientific endeavors of, of OMI. And um, I'm not sure if you know, but recently the management at KMI changed considerably, so we have a completely new management now. And uh, we had a management team meeting uh, one or two weeks ago, and there are many new people in this management team. And climate and weather is put together, so I'm not anyway. It's not only uh, not a separate climate department anymore. So I had to explain to people who are not really part of the field what is the importance of satellite measurements. And I came to two main themes, which I will give some examples. So one is that uh, when you look at top circuit research, we finally get data records which are 30, 40 years, and that means that we get into the climate time frame. And hopefully when we continue this, set, this data sets, we, will, we can really give a lot of information for climate research because they are global and they will be continuously there. So I will give an example for that. Uh, mainly focused on emission sources. And the second one uh, which st struck me is that satellite data, most of the satellite data nowadays, not all of them, but a lot of them, are available in real time, which means within three hours after measurement. That means that you can use it for forecast. 
And I didn't realize, but it's actually quite exceptional because most of the ground-based data, Dobson, Boer, Max Doas, Pandora, all the data we use for validation, <coughs> it takes you one, two, three months to get the data. So satellite data, actually, it's, it's very interesting that we are able to produce them so fast while taken so far away. I think that's a great advantage of satellite data. So I'll give an example of that too. Okay, this is a short summary of the instrument. It's a UV-VIS instrument. The in new thing of OMI, it used a two-dimensional detector, meant that we could uh, measure the complete globe in one day with a very high spatial resolution at the same time. And still, at this point in time, this UV-VIS instrument has the highest spatial resolution currently available at, uh, for satellite instruments. And in the end, I will show you one or two slides on top of OMI, which is a new instrument, which will even have a higher spatial resolution. So this is, the, I think, the famous result of OMI, the tropospheric NO2 map. And I'm not going to talk a lot about it. You see all the pollution, uh, the, the, the pollution you expect to see. Um, we can also make very high resolution maps. It is on a two by two kilometer map for Western Europe. So you can really pinpoint the sources. And we can also see the ship emissions by averaging long enough to see the, the ship, the regular ship routes. <coughs> so when you look at this map, you see that can we really measure the emission sources. And when you realize that since 2012, the new developing countries are actually putting out more CO2 than the already developed countries, the emission sources are to know where they are, are very, very important. What is, uh, and in most cases, these sources will coincide with the NO2 sources. So NO2 emission maps not only give you information for NO2, but can give you more information than that if you interpret the data right. And um, I think that is one of the things which uh, becomes, will become more and more important, although we still have to convince the community we're looking at emission sources that satellite data can actually be available for that. So one of the first things we did uh, with our satellite data is uh, to calculate the emission sources for China. And uh, you see on the right-hand side the OMI and the two measurements. And we developed at KNMI an algorithm, which is called the DEXO algorithm, to calculate the emission sources here for 2008. And at that time, the most recent map was here based on Intex B campaign. Uh, it is a bottom-up emission calculation, and that was the most recent map available. So um, when you use the satellite data, and especially because they're so fast available, and you, when you develop an algorithm which is very fast and is also able to pinpoint the new emission sources, not algorithm, all algorithms can do that, but this one can, then you can really look at changes in China for emissions. So what you, he you see here, for example, is that here in North Korea there's actually no emission. And you see here, for example, the Yangtze River, that there is much more emissions than uh, what was based on this more older graph. It takes a lot of time to, to, uh, to produce. So this map, actually, we can calculate in a couple of weeks. And I think that is a real advantage of satellite missions that we are able to do that. That is also what you see here. We are now in new, working on new projects. Actually, I think Key will talk about Panda. Um, and we work together with Guy on, uh, uh, with China on the emission sources and air, air pollution. And the project we lead at KNMI is called Marco Polo. And Guy leads the Panda project. So we work together on that, which is very, very interesting. And for that work, we, of course, look further in this area. And here you see the map for 2011 for North and South Korea again. You see there's no emissions here in North Korea. And here you see the nighttime lights by Veers, which is also a very, very nice image. But a couple of weeks I uh, ago, I was at the non-CO2 greenhouse gas conference in the Netherlands. And there I discovered that these uh, emission calculation uh, groups, they don't use satellite data except this type. With this, they look at the emission sources. And I think we should try to convince them also to use this type of satellite data to validate at least what they find. So we have still a lot of work to do to get our data really used by communities who uh, calculate the emissions. Well, one of the things we now do is look uh, in the Middle East. We have a cooperation going on with Qatar, and we will have a uh, validation campaign there next year, where we will 
amongst other users are NO2 salt, which is a canamide development. And when you look at the OMI data for this area, you get this image. So top sphic NO2 from OMI for 2008. And when you compare that with uh, the EDCAR database, you get this. So you see that in that database, they put the emissions on the highways, and they put some emissions on the borders, but that, of course, is not a uh, reality, uh, because the emissions are at the cities, which where you expect them to be. So the databases, they really can have a lot of information from our satellite data. And we look now further into this area, so to we look at all these cities, I'll give you a few examples. Here you see an increase in Doha, in Qatar, in NO2, this is all OMI data. Here you see decrease in Dubai, which you can understand because, uh, well, there's no place to build anything anymore. And they also put uh, regulation, air quality regulation, actually, in Dubai. And you see here increases OMI and COM2 data, you see here. Increase in uh, Iraq due to the use of this oil field. And you see decreases in Iran on s due to the uh, measures, the where economic measures taken by the other countries, so they have less, less economic production. So I think satellite data can be very valuable for these emission sources, and I, uh, I really hope that at some point our data will be used for that. Uh, well, the other example is uh, the, the forecast. And for that I uh, use the MEC project. It's a European Union effort, atmospheric services, they produce in, the pro in this project, and from next year onward, it will not be called MAC, but CAN, but uh, it will do similar things. And here you see that they have basically eight main uh, focus areas, so fire and smoke, as global pollution, air quality, flux inversions for CO2, aerosols, and UV index, and OMI data are actually used in seven of these eight product lines. And, uh, well, of course, very happy with that. And uh, one of the things we do in that project is now we look, um, our data are used in uh, assimilation mode for the global air pollution calculations, also for the pollution calculations for Europe. And then this, again, is used as a boundary condition for our national forecast. So this is our national forecast for pollution in the Netherlands. And uh, in that project, we actually, usually we don't look at SO2, we only look at NO2 and aerosols and ozone because that are the pollutants in the Netherlands. We basically have no pollution from SO2 anymore for the last 20, 30, 40 years. But suddenly, uh, in September this year, you see here the crowd-based network in the Netherlands, these are sniff poles, the SO2 increased to about 20 micrograms per cube meter, which is a lot because normally we are well, we have nothing, basically. So we are very, very anxious to find out to what that came, and it turned out that this volcano in Iceland, which is, uh, again, a difficult name to pronounce, produced, uh, a lot, uh, produced SO2 on a continuous basis, more or less. So it's, it's, not, it's a rutin, but not very fiery. So it produced this cloud, and the cloud came to here, to the Netherlands, and when we used in our territory model, we could prove that this <coughs> SO2 from this volcano actually caused pollution, SO2 pollution, in the Netherlands. So this is uh, a, a half operational service we now have at KNMI. We hope to make it really uh, operational. Usually we only look at volcanoes for aircraft, for uh, aviation control. And this was really a very interesting example to see that it can still lead to pollution. Okay, now I come to the result with her hurdles. So when I started on Aura, uh, we were very interested in the hurdles instrument because it would be able to provide us ozone profiles with a very high vertical resolution over the tropopause. So then you could combine OMI ozone with these profiles and get a grab on tropospheric ozone. Uh, the other product we were very interested in were the NO2 vertical profiles because we would like to use that to to combine it with our columns to get tropospheric NO2. Well, we, we had uh, different means now to retrieve tropospheric NO2, but nevertheless, uh, this year or last year, we started to look at the cloudy data. So usually we look at the clear data to measure the troposphere, but now we wanted to look at the cloudy data to measure the NO2 above it and use a kind of cloud slicing technique, which was also used for ozone, to get an NO2 profile. 
Um, but before doing that, of course, we have to know if our, for, of, if our stratospheric NO2 column has some value. And for that, we could use the hurdles NO2 profiles, which were, I think, produced for the first time two years ago, two or three years ago. And uh, so we compared with the hurdles, uh, we, uh, we, we calculated stratospheric NO2 column based on hurdles data, and we found differences with our uh, stratospheric NO2 column from OMI. So what we then did, we compared hurdles with Skiermarkie and MIPAS to be sure, uh, of course we trusted hurdles blindly, but okay, we had to make this uh, comparison. <laughs> and it turned out that hurdles was doing a very, very good job actually. And all these uh, instruments, they gave very uh, tight agreement on what they measured on NO2. So we knew we could trust it. And this was actually what we saw when we then put our data in. So you see here the stratospheric and the two column from OMI. You see here the stratospheric and the two column from Skiermaki from the Nader measurement. Skiermaki has Nader and Limp measurements. And you see here the three instruments, hurdles, MIPAS and Skiermaki Limp measurements on the uh, stratospheric NO2. And you see there's a clear bias. And uh, it, it got to, to some uh, active communication in Europe, because also Ski and Makinomi didn't, didn't agree, so people were a bit confused what's happening here. And in the end it turned out that our fitting algorithm uh, for OMI, that, the, that caused some biases, and all these biases end up in the stratospheric and the two column. I'm not going to explain why, because it's very complicated, but that's what happened. So we looked again at our uh, fitting algorithm and we found the small, very tiny, tiny, tiny things, all these small errors. And now actually, I cannot show the plot yet, but we were able to correct our stratospheric and a two column. And we are now on top of your limp measurements. So uh, in the end, we were able to have a combined uh, uh, product. We used it mostly for validation because the amount of data, of course, is not sufficient, but also for that it's very good that we have it. We actually were able to find an error in our NO2 retrieval. Okay, now I've shortly talk about the future. So it has been uh, said, uh, discussed by a few people here, and I hear this is the European side of, uh, of the future. And uh, for tropospheric measurements, I think we have some future in Europe. For limp measurements, also in Europe there's nothing. So that's, that's really a big problem, I think, but for troposphere we have we have some at stake. So we started with GOM-1 in 1995, and I st started to work at k in 1993. <coughs> so I worked with all these instruments. So GOM-1, Skiermaki, OMI, GOM-2, and TROP-OMI, where we also are the PI, and we are working very hard at this moment on this instrument. And then we will get Sentinel-4 and Sentinel-5. So Sentinel-4 is like tempo, it's a geostationary UVN instrument. It's, these are ESA instruments. Sentinel-5 is like top OMI, has one extra channel. And this will be a polar instrument, polar satellite. So this will be flown three times. So we, we will have 20, 25 years measurements from this type of instrumentation. And Sentinel-4 will be flown twice. So that, that, that are the plans. And uh, this December, the ESA Ministerial Conference is there and decisions Final decisions will be taken on Sentinel-5. Sentinel-4 is already decided. Okay, so TROP-OMI is an instrument like uh, OMI. Um, it's an instrument built in the, designed in the Netherlands. We work on it together with ESA. And it will be launched uh, somewhere early 2016. It has a seven-year design lifetime. And uh, what TROP-OMI has extra is, uh, compared to OMI, is the O2A band, which will give us extra information on clouds and aerosols, and the sphere band, which is, uh, gives us CO and methane. And if you compare OMI to top OMI, uh, the largest advantage is the six times higher spatial resolution. We go to seven by seven kilometers. You see here the spot in the Netherlands. You see OMI spot around it. And what you do not see in this image is GOM-1. GOM-1 does not fit in this image because the spots of GOM-1 were 320 by 40 kilometers. So in 25 years, we had a huge advantage in our uh, resolution, in our instrumentation. So we are currently very hard working on this instrument. You see here myself in front of the instrument, which is much larger than OMI due to the extra channels and the higher signal-to-noise. And in one or two weeks from now, we will go into calibration 
And uh, well, it's a very, very exciting times uh, for us. And apart from that, we also work on uh, other instrumentation, uh, new instrumentation like Tropolite, which is a much smaller instrument with very high spatial resolution. We want to go to two by two kilometers. And we work on Sentinel-4 and Sentinel-5 together with ESA. So, John, uh, this is a photo I took from you during this 10-year aura anniversary. We had this open mic uh, evening. It was invented by Anne. And it was a, a, a huge success. And you taught us our experience with, with hurdles mainly and uh, how you uh, uh, yeah, cut to that program. And, um, well, I think it's just uh, amazing. Many people already said it, but that's what I remember of you. This dedication is really amazing. And that you were able to keep the spirit up with, uh, with what happened to hurdles. I, uh, well, we can only learn from that, I think. So thank you for working with you. I have a present. Yeah. I forgot my present. That's okay. chocolate. No, I, I, <laughs> no chocolate. No, one of the things I uh, see you always walking with are, are, are cups. Not with milk, but with coffee or tea, as far as I'm, I'm, uh, I'm informed. And uh, you might know that in my family we have a coffee and tea company. And if you don't know, then you know it now. And from that family, from that company, I bring you tea. It's called Simon Leefeld, the company. And I bring you coffee for uh, filter, filter coffee. I'm not sure if you drink that, but I hope. Most Americans do that, so I choose for that and not for espresso. Okay. So our last uh, talk of the afternoon is by our inquired distinguished scientist, uh, Dr. Herr Professor. <laughs> Monsieur. Record, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Sorry, let me just. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's tight list, but uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for the nice invitation to talk to you today. Um, I'm a bit impressed, I must say, to be in front here of, or having in front of me all these brilliant uh, PI of successful field uh, space experiment. I'm only a little modeler here, and uh, <laughs> uh, one of those who probably had a lot of uh, time to understand what an average kernel is, uh, who still don't quite understand why you have to discuss so much about the a priori assumption that you make <laughs> in a retrieval. And uh, also, somebody who, of course, knows that models are sometimes very far from reality, but still don't quite understand how close observational data are from reality. And so it's very uh, interesting to hear the presentation today. Uh, by the way, I still don't understand why uh, to be a good experimentalist, you have to drink milk and eat cheese. But <laughs> that's something that uh, I learned today. And of course, um, when, I, when I heard that I was the last speaker, I had a moment of panic because I knew that everything would have been said, all the jokes would have been uh, explained, and uh, at the end, uh, all the pictures would have been shown. I didn't really know what to do with my presentation. So I kind of decided that I would look a bit at the field of atmospheric chemistry and see how it has evolved in the last years, very often because of the space experiment. And clearly, we have been going to a large extent, when I started to be in the field from a very exploratory uh, situation, into something now that is much more operational and serves a number of societal demands. And so, uh, looking at chemical weather, looking at air pollution, which uh, I hear uh, is the cause of um, three million premature death every day, becomes a, a very important problem for society. So looking at the evolution of the field, as I said, in the 90s, we had a large number of exploratory surface and airborne field campaigns. 
some done here at NCAR, uh, uh, for example, at Mauna Loa, but also uh, organized by, uh, uh, no, by NASA in particular. Uh, Joe McNeil was leading a number of those field campaigns, which really brought us knowledge on how an air mass chemically can be, uh, can be chemically characterized. Then in the 90s, we developed the first um, chemical transport models to uh, really assess, first of all, the changes in the oxidizing capacity of, of the atmosphere, trying to get a global view uh, from the computer first, but also then, of course, having the space observation at that time that uh, provided global field of the chemicals in the lower atmosphere in particular, uh, after having spent a lot of time understanding the chemistry, the dynamics uh, of the stratosphere. In the, ter in the, in the, in the beginning of, of uh, 2000s, the uh, role of aerosol became uh, critical, important, uh, appeared to be very complicated. We didn't really understand. The, the climate models, though they understood that everything was sulfate, but then the chemists showed that sulfate was a minority, very often of aerosol, that they were much more complicated than that. And this, the, the research is going on. Uh, emphasis now also on more regional aspects, like, for example, urban air quality, in particular around mega cities, and we'll say a word about air pollution in China. And uh, more and more now, in the last year, operational assimilation of space observation and also surface measurements to provide global uh, air quality uh, prediction. And as I told you, these things are important. Air pollution, says a newspaper, The Guardian, uh, will become bigger global killer than dirty water. And OECD report that, <laughs> that uh, about 3.6 million people die premature, or will die prematurely 2050. So it's a huge issue when you see here a picture in Beijing, uh, China. Air pollution now kills more people than high cholesterol. So that's kind of an, uh, a shocking news that uh, was uh, produced here. And if you look, it's not only in China. Uh, I just read yesterday that India has decided to move very aggressively towards coal uh, production for energy. And if you look at the premature mortality at the moment, the cost that it uh, uh, that, that, I mean, we're talking about mi billion uh, of, of dollars. So space and surface observation of uh, air pollutant became uh, crucial to address this problem since we know that the first step in solving the problem is to measuring uh, the causes uh, of, of the problem and the reality of the problem. And so, of course, Moped is there, uh, Yazi is there. They look very similar to a modeler, but if you look more carefully, you see also differences, and those differences need, of course, to be uh, understood. Uh, OMI, we just heard Peter Nell talking about OMI, OMI, uh, looks at NO2, and NO2 is this um, very important property of, of being uh, short-lived, so that basically you see the emission, while CO, which is longer-lived, three months or two or three months, gives you a lot of information about uh, intercontinental transport, uh, vertical convection, a very important tracer for those who want to understand the dynamics of the atmosphere. Now, we start having also observation of PM 2.5, what is, of course, a major issue for, for Asia. And as you know, China, for example, has now a national program to try to reduce the level of uh, PM 2.5. Satellite observation are uh, important here, too. So monitoring, analyzing, and predicting chemical weather or air pollution. Uh, you just heard from Peter Nell about the MAC project in Europe, which is led by uh, ECMWF with the contribution of a large number of uh, meteorological and research and other research institutions in Europe, uh, monitoring atmospheric composition and climate. It's going to become a real operational uh, service for, for the atmosphere. The idea is to bring satellite observation, uh, ground-based uh, uh, measurements, and model together into some kind of an assimilation process that finally produce a number of consistent fields, not necessarily perfectly the reality, but at least consistent. And then, of course, 
also very useful when you do a number of field campaign like here, uh, airborne or uh, surface, or you look looking at air pollution problem. The um, ECM modeling framework for uh, this uh, project is shown here, uh, dealing with greenhouse gases, reactive gases, uh, aerosol, and finally, trying to go from observation and other data through a process that is kind of shown here into products that are directly usable uh, by a number of people who are dealing with these issues. And you see here the kind of uh, product that are coming out, uh, air quality forecast globally, but also uh, in, in regionally in Europe, uh, stratospheric ozone records, UV index, aerosol forecast, and also information about uh, emissions, in particular here, as you say, methane emissions. And so the approach is the following. You see the data, the input data to the, to the process, uh, it's not only uh, chemical data, but also meteorological data that are coming up. Uh, emissions need to be known and estimated, and emissions are anything except constant uh, bodies. I mean, they're changing all the time. Uh, we need, of course, uh, to know land and ocean uh, conditions. This will be then uh, integrated in a model. There will be data simulation in the model and then a forecast of the global field. By the way, I should indicate that the kind of approach is also used by Louisa Emmons here at NCAR. And uh, every day, as I think Bill mentioned that this morning, uh, produce this kind of map uh, also, which can then be regionalized here in this case in, in Europe by different regional chemical transport model, which, by the way, produce different maps, and these maps need to be then analyzed, but uh, it's kind of a multi-model ensemble of regional uh, prediction. It's interesting to see how important the satellite, the space observation, are in particular MOPED. This is here the difference in percent of the field calculated by the ECMWF prediction model compared without a simulation, compared to the MOPED data. And you see that the models clearly overestimate CO in the tropics, underestimated in the northern hemisphere. So if you then uh, add the assimilation process, you come to a much better agreement. Of course, it's not 100% everywhere because uh, that's the way assimilation function. But you start to have a coherent field that shows you uh, how both I'd say the, the, the physical law and the chemical uh, law and the observation kind of match together. And then you, you have to go and start validating your product. And here is, for example, a comparison between the observation, and you see the observation from two versions of MOPED, as well as from Yazi in black. And then in color, you see uh, in red the uh, prediction product that uh, is done, as well as uh, some simulation done by two models, Mozart and TM5, that are coupled to the, uh, to the ECMWF uh, prediction system. And you see that for uh, Europe on the left, for the US on the right, you see then uh, for some fire region in Siberia and in Alaska, and it runs from beginning 2012 to uh, present. You see, for example, that models usually underestimate uh, CO in the non-hemisphere, and it's not really understood why. It's the case from many, and in fact, from all the models. You also see that in the region affected by the fires, both observations and models show uh, a number of differences. Now, you can look at uh, predictions. This is the predictions for today. Uh, the global prediction of carbon monoxide, and you see it's complicated. You see, by the way, the high value over Asia, in particular, non-India and, and China, but you see also some high value uh, in, in North America and in, in the tropics. This is now the prediction for today of NO2 that uh, assimilates, of course, for, for in the process, uh, the OMI data. The, the previous one assimilated MOPET, and you see even here the, the, the mark of, of the ship uh, trails in the, in the ocean, but again, high values in uh, areas, in particular in uh, Asia. So we're talking about Asia, and uh, let me just say a few words, because we are involved, beside the MAC project, 
in the Panda project, which is essentially a downscaling of the ECMW prediction in uh, Asia. And of course, Asia is a complicated region. Topographically, this is a ozone column, but it shows you the complexity of the chemical uh, environment that exists uh, in, in this region, and it's also changing with season. It also highlights, of course, the very high level of pollution. These are pictures taken in, in several cities of, of Asia showing you the, the high uh, aerosol PM uh, uh, level uh, that makes life for hundreds of millions of people, billions of people, in fact, very, very difficult. Uh, you see here from space, of course, the haze that is seen on the left-hand side over northern India in the Gange Valley, and then on the, on the uh, right hand side over China, showing that it's not a local problem, but it's really a regional problem that covers the entire eastern part of the country. You see here the trends in visibility in, in China uh, that has been uh, dramatically important uh, starting really in the 90s and no uh, improvement. Uh, also the, the premature death uh, estimated in this part of the world of about three years on the average, and this uh, life expectancy is expected to further decrease by five to 12 months, or by a year almost, in 2030. So it's a real societal problem. It's a complicated problem. This is the uh, chemical composition of the aerosol measured at a number of stations in China and in Japan, and you see the strong uh, proportion of organic aerosols, which uh, are there. You also see, in particular, uh, the role of black carbon uh, in, in, in China. Uh, and uh, more information is really needed to understand uh, the origin of these different type of, of particles. So the PANDA project, which is a common, a joint project between, Euro between seven European partners and seven Chinese partners, is exactly to use space observation as well as in situ data and numerical models to, mon to monitor, analyze, and <coughs> forecast global and regional air quality, regional air quality, of course, around China. You see here the different groups involved. Uh, I don't want to go too much into detail, but they are from different countries in Europe and from the best universities and research centers in uh, China. It was, of course, a challenge to put together a joint project between China and Europe to make sure that the Chinese partners who are not really involved, have not been really involved in European project, follow the rules and pro produce the deliverables that they're supposed to produce at the right time and uh, use appropriately the money that is then coming from the European Commission to hire postdocs and contribute to, to the project. As uh, Peter Nell said, this project uh, works in parallel to another project called Marco Polo. Marco Polo is more at looking at the emissions, deriving the emissions from the satellite observation. This PANDA project and both collaborate very strongly, is more to basically downscale prediction to uh, the level, the local level, on the basis of the global prediction with a simulated satellite observation uh, that ECMWF predicts. So you see here on the right hand side the satellite data, and this is now for, let's say, CO. You see the global prediction that is coming from the MAC uh, forecast and analysis. This is used as initial and boundary condition for our downscaling exercise. We first use the WAFCAM model at a resolution of 60 kilometers, covering essentially all Asia from the Gulf to east of Japan, from 10 degrees south to 50 degrees now north. And then in this region, we zoom uh, for eastern China with a resolution of 20 kilometer. And we do then, we will do a second zoom in the region that is more populated of eastern China with a seven kilometer uh, resolution, leading to concentration of all the species that we derive, but also an air quality index that could be used immediately by the people uh, in the country. Now, there are already a number of 
uh, information that, are, that you can find on your telephone. This is here an app that gives you, for example, a few days ago in Shanghai, the uh, value of PM2.5 of uh, ozone PM10 uh, with an index that says slightly polluted. The same uh, observations are made at the US uh, consulate coming up to an unhealthy situation. <laughs> uh, but then in uh, Beijing, uh, you see here basically an excellent day, uh, 2.5 uh, on 14, etc. Now the US and embassy also provide data, and these data are not available anymore. The, the apps, Chinese apps as data from this source are censored on the orders from government. So they disappeared from the apps about four or five days ago. I think that happens during the visit of President Obama to uh, China. <laughs> well, anyhow, I don't know. Maybe that's a result of his visit. Uh, at least uh, I'm, I'm not sure. So what is important also when you do those kind of uh, prediction is to uh, think about your initial conditions. And you can see that they might be very different from uh, the situation. So if you take the Mozart uh, kind of uh, run for, the, for a particular day, uh, in fact, we are considering in the prototype test, test uh, January 2010, you run Mozart without assimilation. Then you take the MAC surface analysis that has included the assimilation, you see that you have quite uh, different uh, situations. So the initial condition is very important. You have to pay attention to that quite a bit. Now, the surface emissions are also important. Uh, you see here two of them at the top for CO, at the lower level for NO. On the left, these are the so-called Max City. It's a well-known inventory at about 20 kilometer resolution, I think. And then on the right are the HTAP version two, I think, uh, emissions at a higher resolution. Uh, I think it's about 0.1 degrees, so at about uh, 10 kilometers. And you will see that the choice of the emission has, uh, of course, an important impact. Here is, for example, a prototype calculation made for carbon monoxide for January 2010. Uh, you see at the top the, the low, res I mean, the low resolution, 60 kilometer, covers all Asia. Then the zoom in China, and you see then uh, what has been uh, found here with the HTAP uh, emission and what the max CT emissions. And then, of course, all the keys to do some uh, validation uh, of the results based on surface observation that are provided by our Chinese partner. And you see that basically the best uh, fit with the observation, Tavishas is in black, the best fit here in green is obtained with uh, the WAP not but with the 2020 uh, resolution and the HTAP uh, emission, which uh, uh, are in essentially based in China on the emission that the University of uh, Tsinghua has been putting uh, together. This is the case for CO. Uh, if we look here at ozone, we see also uh, that the importance of the choice of emissions, and in fact, uh, we sh I should say that these emissions also include, at that resolution, a diurnal variation to account for the fact that cars are out more in the morning than at noon, for example. And you see that uh, the best fit for the diurnal variation of ozone here is found, again, with one particular set of uh, emissions. Of course, evaluation is very important as you build a prototype. You see here, for example, the type of data that we receive uh, for Shanghai, for Pudong, which is in part of Shanghai, from the Shanghai Meteorological Bureau, they measure NOx, ozone uh, at the top, and you see the maximum, the eight hours maximum ozone, and the best uh, validation of the model is again obtained with the uh, green curve, which is the uh, HTAP um, uh, emissions. So let me just indicate that you know this kind of zoom that exists for Europe that exists now, that we're trying to put together for Asia, we could really be thinking of multiplying this approach and trying to use the same global and regional models, the same space observation, the same methodologies, the same database, and provide it essentially for different regions of the world, North America, South America, Africa, Europe, basically a constellation of regional initiative that would help the people who do real air quality 
management uh, at the local level to have basically the regional uh, situation and a prediction at a resolution that will be at the order of five kilometer or better if we can do it in the future. But that depends very much on how, uh, wh what resolution you get for your uh, emission. And of course, we should also be thinking in the future that the models are evolving. We are working now with the WAF chem model, which has been using by a lot of people in the world, including, by the way, in China, so that's very easy for us. But there are other models coming up. And for example, ELPAS, that is here uh, developed at uh, NCAR, uh, has the attractiveness of being, being a global model, but with the possibility of zooming in certain regions of the world and getting very, very high resolutions uh, prediction without having to jump from a global model to another model and doing all that in one single uh, framework. And of course, the same thing can be said by uh, the spectral uh, element model that uh, is also being developed uh, at NCAR and in cooperation with others. So that's what I wanted to say to tell you and to explain how well those uh, space observations are really important now. They've been key for uh, doing this exploratory science that we have been doing, but they become even more important, I would say, for the operational services that you will see now growing in importance and uh, followed by a number of applications that can be done. People looking at pollen, people looking at asthma uh, vulnerability, and, and those kind of societal uh, important aspect with products. And so I'd like to thank John very much for his leadership. I think I met John in the 70s. It is John who brought me to NCA. I don't know, a lot of people know that, but I came because John invited me, just like many others of you here. And then I decided to stay and uh, to, to work at NCA for uh, two decades, uh, which I've enjoyed very much. I think I'd like to thank John for his contribution to NCAR when I was uh, director of ACD and director of the Earth and Sun System Lab at that time. Um, I think uh, he has provided a lot of leadership for the scientific community. Thanks for contributing to the science needed to improve air quality in the world. Best wish for the future. And I'm going to finish with a photo that I took in Sicily as we were visiting uh, a Roman temple, uh, maybe a Greek temple that was there in Sicily, I don't remember. This is John. And I always felt that John had something of an imperial touch. <laughs> <laughs> and in the way he is really approaching the problem. Being an emperor in atmospheric science and being an emperor in uh, satellite uh, development and, and all of his career, uh, thank you very much, and please best wishes for, for the future. We're expecting from you one or two more satellites in the next day. <laughs> <laughs>